Hey, Hawkeye fans, Chad Leistico of the Des Moines Register, a newsy day here in Orlando. Um, man, uh, my head's kind of spinning here. Tyler Tashman, also the Register, joining us. Uh, he wrote the, the latest news story uh, to develop on the Hawkeye football beat, which is Luke Lachey coming back for the 2024 season. Uh, man, uh, you know, I kind of thought it was maybe trending this way, Tyler, but uh, definitely didn't anticipate it actually, you know, being announced today. I just feel like it's sort of continuing what's been uh, a good news week for the Hawkeyes. It's a lot of these kind of stay-go decisions as, as the, you know, bowl season gets – or bowl game gets closer that, um, you know, are really pivotal into how I was – roster is going to look like um, in 2024, but uh, Jay Higgins announces he's coming back, uh, now Luke Lachey. So some of those, you know, dominoes kind of falling, uh, you know, in the in favor of Iowa. And uh, it seems like Iowa right now at least is, is going addition by retention, right? They're kind of, you know, last season was a little bit heavier in the portal than usual, but a lot of those guys that are kind of could leave or could come back, um, Iowa really wants them back, and they're probably honestly better than anybody else that Iowa could get in the portal. So, um, you know, I, I think that plan is uh, a good one based on those guys, th those kind of group of guys that that you have with, that could go either way. But um, and Luke Lachey is, I mean, he he looked like he was going to have a really good season this season. And then obviously he goes down against Western Michigan. Uh, he, he was good in 2022, but he was kind of – in the shadow of Sam Laporta, you know, when Laporta wasn't hurt, but it, it felt like this season was his chance to be kind of that primary option. Um, and he was that way until he got hurt, but now coming back, you know, gives him another chance to, to be that guy. I was just texting Dargan, who's uh, coordinating the podcast. He's going to jump on a little later for our five big questions segment. I thought he was going to jump on and then all of a sudden we started and he just disappeared. So, uh, you know, not that not that we can't do it, but he's like our Tennessee expert. So we're gonna get the five big questions. This is gonna be like our Citrus Bowl preview episode. Uh, <laughs> Dargan says his son was being loud in the background, so now I get it. Okay, got it. But so Tyler and I will take it for now. Uh, but yeah, Luke Lachey. You know, Tyler Barnes, the recruiting director, tweeted this, and I kind of retweeted it. Um, you know, just to get Higgins and Lachey back, those were two, <laughs> two of your four game day captains to start the year. It's really rare that you bring back one of those guys. Now you're getting two back for the 2024 season. And actually, Cade McNamara would be three, right? So <laughs> I don't, was he ever a captain? He was, right? He was to start the season. Yeah. yeah. So they, Before he yeah. got hurt, yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, they're just bringing back, like, all their leadership, uh, which is – you know, which actually was an offseason storyline this past year. Like, oh, how do you get back after losing Jack Campbell, Sam Laporta, you know, those kind of kind of leaders, Kayvon Merriweather, whatnot, uh, Riley Moss. And, uh, yeah, they've, you know, they're going to have two straight years of, of pretty strong leadership. And I will have to say, just being down here, it's just, uh, I mean, this team is just so together, so tight. And uh, to continue that is uh, – it's really a big deal for the Hawkeyes, uh, whoever the offensive coordinator is, and we're going to get to that a little bit. But I've had people ask me also, Tyler, you know, what, you know, is Eric All going to come back too? And um, I don't, I just don't think that it, there's really a need for him. You know, Iowa would have to kind of make room for him. You know, probably get some NIL money for him, whatever. I'm not saying he can't or wouldn't, but I think they're pretty good with Lachey and Ostranga at this point coming back for next year. And I think honestly, if you're Eric all, it's sort of like, you know, you know, what is my place? I don't know. I, I just, I, I'm kind of discarding. I haven't really heard any, any movement on him, I, but I think the Lachey Ostranga combo next year really sounds, I mean, that's a great starting point for whoever the new OC is going to be. It's a great foundation to continue to build off of because there's so much unknown going into the offense offense next season starting with the fact that we don't even know who's going to be offensive coordinator yet. <clears throat> Excuse me. But then you also have the fact that like Cade McNamara is coming off two con you know, consecutive uh, season ending injuries. Like, is he going to be ready for, you know, the, the first game of the season? Is he going to be healthy? Can he stay healthy? Uh, then you have the question of like, is Iowa going to have enough receipt, like capable receivers, you know, what, you know, what is that, you know, what does that look like? It, it certainly seems like tight end is a position where 
uh, is going to be is going to be a strong position group for Iowa next season. And that's why I think Lachey coming back really cements that. And it's not Luke Lachey coming back is by no means like Iowa's offense is going to turn around, you know, but it's a step in the right direction toward getting there because it's an offense that um, the, the past two seasons have just been really, really bad. So it's going to take a, a, you know, a, a collective effort, but to have a guy like Luke Lachey coming back, who, if he's healthy for the entirety of the season, feels like he could be the number one guy on an offense. That's meaningful, especially when you have a lot of unknown moving forward in the next season. And to that point, uh, you know, we talked to Estrenga a couple days ago, and you know, he, he's not much of a quote yet, but uh, the, he's he's becoming a really good player, and he kind of talked about how, and and imagine kind of that room. I mean, he had Sam Laporta and Luke Lachey in there to kind of guide him along, and then Eric All as well to go along with that. And so he he learned pretty quickly about what it t- what it takes to be, you know, a player on the field. He was just a true sophomore this year. And so I really like his – I really like what he's potentially going to bring next year to this team. So I'm, I'm pretty pumped um, to watch Lachey and Ostringa. And then to continue what you were talking about at, in the receiver room, uh, talked to Nico Regaini today, and uh, he, he kind of talked about how Caleb Brown has really – ascended not just on the field but off the field like there's just a vibe about him he's like growing so much and so fast in confidence um that he can be a weapon for this team and i think we're starting to see that he had all 19 of his catches you know post uh <laughs> post brian ferentz announcement um so he's been a late ascending guy but i think he's he's definitely a guy i feel like you can count on also in that passing game going into next year because of just the dynamic athletic ability he brings to the table and now he's adding that leadership adding that you know time on the field so I feel really good about those three spots just for Cade to throw to and then uh, just as a little morsel of uh, you know people like these things that, during the bowl games um, you know who, hey, who's looking good and the first name out of out of Nico's mouth was Jacob Bostic and that's another name I've heard a lot this week I I know I keep hyping him up to you uh Tyler but I think he's gonna get his first catch this week that's my prediction um but yeah Jacob Bostic tall rangy guy who just had bad injury luck his first two years and you know I think he could be something at some point and so I don't know there's just some pieces now to work with on offense you don't feel like you're you're giving the new OC just a bare cupboard uh coming in I think another guy that could really use a bowl game to as like a launch pad is Seth Anderson because he was a guy that like during kids day he flashed early in the season he, he kind of flashed and then he kind of you know emergence of Caleb Brown he kind of seemed to take a back seat but he's a guy that's been he's been productive in college at Charleston Southern this season just you know with everything that's gone on in the offense um hasn't quite found his footing but I feel like if he can have a really good bowl game, use that as a, a launch pad in the next season, he's a guy that uh, could have a lot of value um, in next season's offense and, and as a, you know, as a reliable target moving forward. seems like uh, as we can kind of finish or whatever the Lachey conversation here is, uh, there's other guys, right, that can come back. And uh, I still, you know, Cooper DeGene, you know, I think I've mentioned it on this podcast already. He's my number one in terms of guys you'd want to come back. But Lachey was two and Higgins was three. So you got your two, three. Castro would be four. Uh, he said, I think was, I'm losing track of the days. And I don't think we've talked about this on the podcast. But he said yesterday that um, he would be uh, announcing what he's going to do like within a few days after the bowl game. Uh, Jamari Harris kind of indicated the same thing today. Uh, Quinn Schulte, uh, I don't know. He he didn't he didn't tell much on on what he was going to do, but uh, I just got the sense, Tyler, that I, and I don't want to mislead people because I don't know that I don't know what they're going to do. But I just got the feel that Castro and Harris were leaning towards coming back. Just kind of the vibe I got, and I think. I think the the Higgins and Lachey stuff has to be an incentive to come back, you know, yeah. to be playing with those guys once again. Well, and I know – go ahead. No, sorry. I thought you were done. No, and I was just going to say, I know Brad Heinrich over at uh, 
uh, Iowa Swarm has really been doing working hard to try to get those guys as much as he can to return to kind of sweeten the pot or whatever you want to call it uh, to bring those guys back. So it is, you know, it's not like it used to be where there was just a, hey, another year of college, you know, you know, get, you know, there, there is some financial incentive to come back now as well. Yeah. I mean, well, I was just going to say when we were talking to the guys, um, you know, before they went down to Florida and all that, they were saying, I mean, that there are internal conversations about, you know, who, you know, are you, you know, what are you thinking and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it, it does seem like it could be sort of it's easier to see a domino effect happening where if, you know, Jay comes back and Luke comes back, that um, there's just more appeal to come back because of what is possible next season. It raises the expectations for, um, you know, what seems possible and the Big Ten is changing. But there's also going to be a 12 team playoff. And I mean, I'm sure we'll have a lot of time to talk about that coming into next season. But like. Iowa would have been in the conversation for that this season, like before the Big Ten championship, if or if they beat Minnesota, but that's a whole nother story. But anyways, they wouldn't have been like that far out of a 12 team playoff is my point. So um, and and just like you were saying, the the vibe in the program, like I think it's the, the culture that I was built. It's not something that is like makes it easy to leave. I think the fact that some of these guys are even considering coming back like is a testament to the culture and bond that those guys, and especially what they've been through this season. Cause I feel like that probably brought them even closer. All the injuries, Brian Ferentz, you know, uh, invalid fair catch that, you know, the fact that guys are even thinking about coming back is just a testament to, you know, the culture inside the program. Never forget the invalid fair catch. We will never let anyone forget it. No, it's, <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, the, uh, the other guy we didn't have, you know, kind of ruled out almost was Nick Jackson. And he talked yesterday about that possibility now that he's uh, gotten a waiver from the NCAA to return for a sixth year, which is crazy. If you look at his career, like stats and, and uh, just volume of, of snaps that he has, has played in his career, this will be his 60th college game on Monday. If he were to somehow come back, I mean, this, he's going to be crossing 70, 72, 73 games in a college career, something we'll never, ever see because, <laughs> you know, unless there's like a double COVID pandemic or something. So um, it, it's not something that he was expecting to have to think about, and he was pretty intent on going to the NFL, it sounds like. But he also <laughs> he also talked about, Tyler, like how much he loves it here and like how much this one year at Iowa has been – so good to him, you know, personally, uh, that, you know, Jay Higgins, he said, that's my best friend. I mean, th there's going to be some interesting conversations in the Nick Jackson family, because he said it will be a family decision as well um, on this whole thing. So uh, that's another one. I mean, God, can you imagine if Castro, you know, Higgins, Jackson, Harris, maybe Schulte, you know, all come back off that defense. And I mean, I, I don't know if they'll, if the state of Iowa will be able to contain it. If Cooper DeGene somehow pulls some kind of surprise and says he's coming back too. Well, it's like, what if, what if next year, if all, if a handful of those guys have come back on defense and I was like a hundredth offensively in the FBS, like that's all they need to be really like 110th, like 96, something in that ballpark in, that I mean, with that defense, I mean, I, they may they may allow less points per game than this season if if a bunch of those guys come back. So really, the yeah, that's the the offense that doesn't really even it needs to be bad. If like you know the offense is bad next season, they could be in really good shape. Brings up a whole nother conversation, which we'll get to in five big questions about next year's quarterback. But uh, let's move on. We, I thought we'd talk 15 minutes at least on Brian Ferentz. We haven't even mentioned his name, I don't think, yet. But Brian Ferentz with a surprise appearance today uh, here in the uh, Rosen Plaza in Orlando. Um, Abdul Hodge, it was supposed to be coordinators. So Tennessee's offensive and defensive coordinator came and talked. And then um, all of a sudden, you know, uh, Abdul Hodge was on the menu and uh, Brian Ferentz walks through the door. And so uh, I kind of, I, I put this in my column, it's up at hawkcenter.com, but he apparently 
decided yesterday afternoon that he was going to go ahead and talk and sort of uh, let his, you know, kind of have the final word, I guess, on his career. I mean, the game will sort of say that too, but uh, interesting that he talked. I was not expecting that. Uh, uh, in fact, Iowa officials weren't even expecting that. So what do you make, Tyler, from afar of Brian just kind of taking the taking the stage, so to speak, and uh, kind of uh, becoming the story today, even though he didn't want to be the story? I think – two things can be true. One is that it was it was time to move on from him and get a new offensive coordinator. I think if it, if it wasn't a consensus among the fan base, it was a near consensus that there needed to be changes after the last two seasons, especially on offense. But I also think that the way that Brian Ferentz has handled everything uh, has been really admirable. He uh, just has seemed to really, I mean, take things in stride, and, and, you know, reading through what he said today of just he, he doesn't want it to be about him. You know, he, want, he wants it to be about the team. He cares deeply about Iowa. And, um, you know, it's, it was a, a very difficult situation. And, and the timing of it really, I think, is what probably ruffled mo- the most feathers to the fact that it was during the middle of the season and it was kind of a unnecessary hurdle thrown into things that, that didn't need to be that didn't need to be there, you know, cause I, the, the whole points per game thing, I think what made everything more a distraction. Yeah. I think that that could have been eliminated by just either moving on after last season or, you know, I don't know, but I thought that was a real distraction, but the way that uh, Brian has seemed to handle things, um, you know, I, I think has been, uh, it's been, he's been very respectful and just very professional about it. Yeah, Logan Jones uh, really raved about yeah Brian's uh, handling or you know how he was as a man and and how his family respects him too and so there is uh, there has been some win it for Brian um, sentiment among the players some aren't are saying eh, it's just you know we just want to win the game and, and whatnot but uh, and, and Brian definitely you know wanted to deflect that. Uh, I mean, it was he kind of seemed surprised that there were so many questions, um, you know, toward him. But he hasn't talked since August 11th, so it was it shouldn't have been a surprise. Uh, I I thought his probably best answer wasn't because of my question; it just happened to be what his stream of consciousness led him to. But I asked him about uh, you know going into his final game uh, and kind of also the Illinois game where there was clearly emotion, his final game at Kinnick Stadium. And, uh, you know, you could see there was emotion, and you know, with him and his dad and, and all that stuff. And uh, he kind of downplayed that Illinois part of it. And then, um, you know, he basically – and then here was kind of the quote I thought was probably the, the top quote of the day that sort of captivates, I think, where Brian's thought process is. And he said uh, – And quite frankly, probably what I resent the most about this situation is that the focus has come off of our football players who have really accomplished some tremendous things this year. And it's gone on to things that quite simply don't matter. They're trivial and silly, in my opinion. And for whatever reason, the focus has gone there instead of on a bunch of players who have worked really hard to overcome a lot of adversity and dealt with a lot of nonsense to win 10 football games and put themselves in a position to win the 11th. So I think, I think the two things he was talking about with the nonsense would be the 25 points per game clause that certainly overshadowed the first half of the season in part, uh, which was removed by, you know, Barbara Wilson, Beth Getz by, by kind of solidifying his future of not being here, but also the clothing apparel choice. That was something I don't care about at all, but it did become a big talking point among fans, uh, some fans, I should say. And so I think that was the other silliness that he was talking about. But obviously, you know, at the same time, Tyler, you know, he kind of brought that on himself by not wearing Hawkeye stuff during some of the games. So what are your thoughts when you see hear that quote, knowing what he's kind of gone through this year? Yeah, I, you know, I think one of the other things that he said that stood out to me was the fact that of just how much he enjoyed working with his father. And that really painted like, the human element to all of this. And, and it's easy for that to kind of get overlooked because of social media and just all the criticism and whatnot. But um, that there is like the very human element to all this behind 
uh, you know, the offensive shortcomings and all that of like, this is a, a father and a son who their relationship is being seared in the national spotlight. Um, it, it's a very, very different, difficult, uh, sensitive, personal relationship that is being picked apart by the public eye. And when we like the right after that news came out and Kirk Ferentz talked about it, he was he was very guarded, I would say. And, and, and I don't blame him for being that way, but he didn't he didn't really seem to let out like his personal feelings about Brian as a son. It was more, he tried to do it more so as Brian as a coach, but I felt like after Iowa clinched the big 10 title uh, against Illinois, he kind of, he peeled back the layers a little bit more and it feels like he's, he's done that um, a little bit now in Orlando as well. But uh, it does really, I think, which is the important thing as it comes to a close here. And there is kind of a finality to things of, just understanding the the father son you know kind of human dynamic to everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was kind of the that was the quote I finished my column with uh, surrounding what it was like to play for his father. Not that it was really touching that Brian said you know working with his father. You know he had this idealistic view of his father like we all do about our parents, and then you know, you know how great they are, all that thing, all that stuff, and. Um, to get to work with him side by side for 12 years and also five years as a player. He said, you know, basically, um, you know, he lived up to everything I imagined that he was type of thing. So that's pretty emotional. That's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, certainly personally wish Brian the best uh, in his next venture, probably in the NFL would be my guess. Uh, but uh, he's obviously coaching in this game. And I think the, the biggest takeaway that a lot of folks had from today's press conference was that he ruled out that Marco Linez would play at all in this game. And so I, people are upset about that. And I think I think they're more upset about the fact that he said Deacon Hill has played great football for us. Wow, you're really setting me up there. with. <laughs> uh, are we going into quarterback? Uh, oh, no, no, not yet. No, I just was uh, – I mean, great football. I don't think he meant that probably. I think he probably would have chosen different words, but maybe he did. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he said he led us to a lot of wins. So, yeah, I mean. He's going to stick with him and go the distance on Monday. Deacon Hill. Yeah. Well, I guess that's a good segue. Can we go into – can I just take that on and talk about Marco? Or? Oh, yeah. go. Yeah, talk about Marco. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, I was – I don't know to say disheartened, but or I, I don't think I was actually surprised to see that him say that, which I mean is kind of telling of the way that things have operated this season. That out of all the times for to give Marco Linus a chance, and there's been a lot of them this season, mm -hmm. this seems like it might be the best because it's you know it's a bowl game, it's a good chance to get younger guys on the field. The the players might disagree with this, but the the stakes aren't as high as a. Uh, you know, a, a big 10 game, it doesn't really mean anything in like the standings. It, it feels to me, it feels almost like a, a preseason game going into next season of like figuring out what young guys can do. And that's why I think it's a great opportunity to, to put Marco out there. And cause we just, we really haven't, we haven't seen him, uh, you know, outside of like kids day at Kinnick. So we don't really know what he can bring. Uh, but intrigued to see like, you know, what, what can he bring to the offense, you know, known as a guy that can use his legs a little bit more. Um, I think this would have been a great opportunity to see him on the field. You know what Deacon Hill can do at this point. I, you know, I'd be surprised if he makes a massive jump between the Big Ten championship and this. Maybe I'll be wrong, but this just seems like a great opportunity to, to see what Marco can do to, to give him a chance to prove himself in game action. But obviously it doesn't seem like it's trending that way. Who knows? Maybe it's uh, maybe it's Brian Ferentz's greatest uh, uh, Houdini act here that he's going to actually start Marco Line or you know do something crazy. And uh, we did see like a few little uh, zone read stuff, you know, in the little bit of practice that we saw. You know, usually the you know that's kind of interesting. You know, last year we saw Sam Laporta operating the Wildcat that actually came to fruition in the game. So we'll see if Iowa runs a little bit of zone read, something like that, or you know. I'm not going to totally rule it out, even though he said no. But uh, a lot of guys have said this week, by the way, that Marco has 
really taken a step forward in December. And that's pretty consistent. Uh, we saw that with Joe Labus last year. Obviously, he was in line for the start. But this bull prep, you know, gives Marco a lot more time to, you know, become an Iowa quarterback. So we're going to get into, like, uh, who the backup quarterback will be next year in our five big questions. But um, pretty uh, – it'll be something to watch, at least, uh, on – Monday. I keep losing track of my days here, but let's uh, let's transition into game talk. If that works for you, Tyler, is there anything else on your list uh, from the last couple of days? He just jumped in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just see him pop up on the screen. No, I was just going to say that I saw like a video on social media of, of some team running like a wide receiver option. So it was like a swing pass. Mm -hmm. And then there were two wide receivers. One of them had the ball. And then one of them like pitched it like 10 yards after running 10 yards. I was like, what if Iowa just pulls some crazy stuff out? Like, and I still can't believe like they tried to throw a pass to Mason Richmond in a, like a real game that, that play, like that play doesn't seem real, but I guess they tried it. So, Yeah. That's too bad. That didn't work. But anyway, Hey, welcome Dargan Southern. These are, uh, our, uh, uh, third guy here on the Hawkeye beat, our women's basketball writer, and also our local Tennessee expert. So he's the perfect guy to have on our five big questions portion of the podcast. Welcome, Dargan. Um, how are you feeling about the the Vols uh, before we get started, you know, uh, as, as we lead up to, to kick off on Monday? Yeah, so first, uh, at the beginning, I was all ready to hop on, and then my son bursted in the room. Um, and was very loud. So I am currently in my mother's closet. So <laughs> that uh, that the sound is good. good. The sound yeah, is really so good. Maybe we should do all podcasts in the closet moving forward. Um, <laughs> man, this this game has really been interesting to to digest. Um, obviously because, um, like I said on on the podcast earlier in the week, um. You know, Tennessee fans, I think they respect Iowa just because of the consistency. But I also feel like they are confident that what Tennessee does is something that Iowa obviously doesn't see hardly at all. And, and that's going to be enough of a uh, shock, I guess, to to overcome maybe some of the struggles that you'll see from Nico Ia Ama Leava. There you go on the pronunciation there. So, um I don't know. I I I I I guess the what I'll settle on is and I've been telling people this. I think this game will look more like an Iowa game than a Tennessee game. And so, I don't know. I guess we'll we'll I'll tease the predictions. I don't know if that's going to be enough for Iowa to win, but I think that Tennessee fans are going to kind of not be in shock but feel a little out of place playing a game the way that Iowa plays. And so, um I I I think you know, I, I was on another podcast and gave my score prediction and it was a Tennessee podcast and the, the person just laughed at, at what uh, I predicted because it's not really anything that Tennessee's ever, uh, you know, I think they, I think 20s may be the lowest they've scored this year um, in a win. So uh, yeah, it, it'll be a, it'll be, I'm, I'm excited for Monday. I, I think it'll be a, a good showing for sure. Awesome. Well, let's get into our, uh, we usually do this, uh, our five big questions and uh, let's, you know, on our Hawk Center radio show, we're going to do it in this uh, platform today on this Friday. It's a, it's weird to do all this stuff on different days, but that's, it's game week. It's Friday. Today is normally Wednesday, right? So um, might as well do it today, right? So our first big question um, starts with the quarterback. Uh, what should we expect from Nico Iyama Leava, the true freshman, the five star? Hopefully I said it right. I was, Gary Dolphin was trying to practice it today. I don't know if it's going to go too well <laughs> but, on the air, but uh, uh, we heard from Tennessee's offensive coordinator today. I was uh, that caught my attention. The things he was saying about this uh, this prospect, uh, he was pretty glowing, uh, honestly, about about Nico. Uh, just to, in terms of what he has grasped in his short time with the program. So they seem pretty excited uh, about what he can bring to the table. Uh, I'll start with you, Dargan, and then I want to go to Tyler too on this. But, uh, you know, what do you kind of expect uh, from from uh, Nico Iyama Leava? Yeah, Gary may just want to stick with Nico on that one. 
uh, moving forward. But no, it. I guess the biggest thing that I've tried to sift through in absorbing Tennessee fans and media and everybody reacting to this change because it was kind of a big deal and, and all that is um, confusing Nico, you know, projecting his success with what he's actually going to do on Monday. And so, you know, obviously a lot of the excitement is about next year and, you know, what this program is going to look like after, you know, Joe Milton had a good season, but I think people were expecting a little more. Um, and so, but I actually think that um, there are going to be several moments where he looks like a freshman quarterback making his first career start in his first uh, significant action. Um, I, I just see, I guess if I had to predict a little bit of, about early on, you know, I think I think Tennessee scores early because they've done that all year. Now, whether that's a seven or a three, I think is important. Obviously, points are at a premium here. But I, I, I just feel like the way that, that Phil Parker adjusts and reacts in game is going to be very important in this because it will take a second to adjust to Tennessee's speed and the way and their tempo and just, you know, the way that they do things. And that's why they have been so successful early in the drive. Um, but, you know, I, I think as the game wears on and, and Iowa's defense kind of settles in, I think you'll see a lot of drives that look like drives against Iowa's defense this year, which are not much explosive plays, you know, some struggles and just, uh, you know, quick, quick drives that, that don't amount to much. So, um, you know, again, I don't know if Iowa's offense is good enough to uh, turn that defensive success into a win. Obviously, that's kind of been what they've had to do um, all season is just how much is Iowa's offense going to produce. And and I think that's that's where my biggest question is. But in terms of of Tennessee's offense and and what is expected, um, I, I I would not be surprised if Nico kind of looks like a guy, even with all the hype, that is you know playing his first extensive college action. Tyler, what do you expect uh, uh, from you know the, a freshman quarterback against Iowa's defense? That's that's a brutal task for like. Here's your first like start in college, and you get to go up against Phil Parker's defense. But Dargan, correct me if I'm wrong that he can he can use his legs a little bit. Um, yes, am I right? He, he runs he runs a little more than Milton, um, which is key for Tennessee's offense to operate. You know, obviously Hendon Hooker did a lot with his legs, and the expectation is that Nico will run a little more and a little uh, is a little more aggressive, I guess, in that element of his game. Yeah, so I mean, the the only really other quarterback that Iowa has faced face similar to that this season is Gavin Wimsett from Rutgers. And um, Iowa did a really good job with him. They did a really good job with Kyle Manungai, who Rutgers, by the way, beat uh, Miami in the bowl game, uh, the pinstripe bowl, I believe it was. But um, the thing that, you know, being a coveted guy, Wimsett or Nico seems like he can do more damage with his arm than Wimsett. Wimsett was a he, he he didn't have a lot of firepower with the arm. A lot of his, you know his damage was with his legs. So curious to see that's a that's a wrinkle, I guess, to how Iowa tries to limit him of a, a guy that can run and throw effectively. Where <clears throat> they limited Wimsett, but he was he wasn't much of a threat with his arm. So curious to see. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if Phil Parker tries to eliminate one of those. You know, you you might ha have to put a spy on him. Maybe this is a game where Sebastian Castro is even more important of his ability, his, his ability to uh, move around and, you know, try to keep him in the, keep him in the pocket. So um, I think, you know, the indication we've been given up to this point is Iowa's defense can handle it, but this might be a kind of unique skill set that they haven't quite seen exactly so far this season. Yeah. Good answers there. Uh, based on what I heard today too. And uh, Jamari Harris talked about, you know, how Tennessee really spreads you out like sideline to sideline with their formations. And so it's really going to be incumbent on the defensive line to win those matchups. And uh, uh, they believe stopping the run is going to be the key to stopping the quarterback, which sounds counterintuitive, but that's kind of, uh, that's what you want to do is get him into third and longs and make him make decisions against, you know, seven guys in coverage, <laughs> you know, and, and try to find some window and then, that's when 
that's when a Xavier Wampa or yeah, Cooper DeGene in the past, uh, you know, somebody like that would would come in and uh, knife in and pick off the ball. So those are the ty- types of turnovers I was going to have to look for, but they got to stop the run first would be my answer. Uh, number two uh, on our big questions on the other side of the ball for Tennessee, how many problems will the Hawkeyes have blocking James Pierce and that defensive line? I know there's been a little bit of attrition here, Dargan, but Pierce, uh, you know, my – Legends and listeners, uh, friend Scott Docterman says he's the best edge rusher Iowa will have seen all year, and that includes uh, Penn State's Chop Robinson. So that got my attention. Uh, how good is James Pierce? How good is this D line? Yeah, I mean, when when I when sorry when Tennessee's defense has had success this year, it's been because the defensive line, um, you know, stays on the quarterback, is aggressive in blitzing, um, and just really disrupts things up front, and that kind of allows you know maybe the secondary a little more leeway to uh account for you know some some issues that have popped up back there but yeah Pierce has has really kind of you know taken this defense by storm and and really should you know have all this spotlight on him with with Tyler Barron entering the portal and, and is now heading to Ole Miss so um it's it you know there's been a lot of frustration this year with Tennessee's defense from fans and um, you know, the defensive coordinator, Tim Banks, has, has gotten some heat this year. Um, but when the defense has performed well in spots, it's because, um, you know, the defensive line is really controlling things at the front. So um, it'll be a, it'll be a, an interesting challenge and, and definitely one that Iowa's O-line should embrace because, um, you know, that's, that's going to be the key to keeping Tennessee's defense, um, you know, under control and, and really – Staying out of the backfield, uh, Tyler. The uh, uh, the offensive line this week is getting a lot healthier. How much do you think that matters? Mason Richmond says he's a hundred percent. Rusty Feth uh, had that shoulder injury that I wrote about um, against Northwestern, who came back in and played, and now he's better. You know, Logan Jones talked today. He's better at center. Uh, Jennings Dunker been practicing at right tackle, so it looks like that that front five is probably going to be. A healthier Richmond, Feth, Jones, Connor Colby, and Dunker. This will be the healthiest we've seen the O line since very early in the season. Does that help? You know, how much does that help the Hawkeyes maybe try to pass protect uh, when Deacon Hill does drop back? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like this is a great opportunity for Iowa's offensive line to kind of put a positive stamp on what has been a season where they've taken steps forward. And, and I know that. You know, last season, especially the offensive line play was an, a, a major issue. And uh, by no means is Iowa's offensive line been like world beaters this season. You know, I, you know, Iowa isn't running for 200 yards a game or anything like that, but um, they have been better. I think they have taken meaningful steps forward. And especially when they've lost some key guys, like you've mentioned, uh, Tyler Ellsbury has been a guy that, you know, stepped up and performed really well when Logan Jones went out. Uh, I think this is a opportunity for now healthy impose their will and, and kind of put, put a stamp on what has been, uh, you know, some good steps forward on an offense where there really hasn't been a whole lot of bright spots. This is fun having a, a, a three person perspective. I like it. Uh, we we got to have more, you know, matchups of teams that you know <laughs> we're familiar with. So maybe some uh, Iowa, Indiana basketball preview podcast with, <laughs> um, yeah. For sure. Yeah. The uh, three man weave, as a yeah. former colleague called it. That's right. That's right. All right. Number uh, three. Also, before you, go ahead. Go ahead. I, yeah, uh, yeah. There's a comment. Uh, somebody wants to know about your facial hair, Tyler. What's going on there? Yeah, it is new. Um, so, what happened was I just had a few days off and just let myself go. So, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm returning from my, uh, my uh, hibernation. So, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. You got men's hoops tonight, right? Men's hoops. Yeah, Northern Illinois, Northern last Illinois. game of 2023. All right, and the women t- and Dargan's got the women tomorrow against the the Golden I got the Gophers. Women. I got the women tomorrow. Tyler has the women tomorrow. That's, that's a ta- right. That's a Tashman I, production. That's a ta- it's a Tashman week. I'm, uh, pinch, I'm pinch hitting. And then you're going up to Madison as well. So yeah, that's mm-hmm. a busy time for you as well. In addition, to, uh, he'll be uh, working with the football game with me uh, remotely. So uh, number three. Uh, Let's go to the Hawkeye side of like more Hawkeye focused here. Can the Iowa defense 
that played against Michigan in the Big Ten title game show up. And, I, you know, people may laugh and say, oh, they lost that game 26 to nothing. But I think anybody who watched that game knows that the Iowa defense made life pretty difficult for the Wolverines. You can't have, um, you know, an 87-yard punt return, the things like that, uh, and, and try to keep up against this team. But uh, can that defense show up? And, and I will start here because Joe Evans – uh, I talked to him for a while yesterday, and this is going to be part of my advance, thinks that if they do give that kind of effort again, that they can cause that kind of disruption against this Tennessee team, which is interesting. I think they feel like they they can, you know, they feel confidence, I feel like, after that Michigan game, uh, you know, that they can – I know they didn't hold you – know, held them to 26 points is not a victory, but it was kind of like the Ohio State game last year where you – you could just see the eye test versus the points in the scoreboard. That defense played dang, dang well. So uh, let's start with you, Tyler, on this one. Um, you know, what level of defense do you think we see on Monday? I think it's basically what we've seen all of this season that, you know, it's really good. Um, and if it is, you know, if they pitch a shutout like they did last season or in the bowl game or allow two field goals or something, I think it's even going to, heighten the expectations even more for what next season's unit can do because you get a look at Jay Higgins is already, already knows he's coming back, but all those other guys that still have decisions to make, um, you know, it, it, it could give a glimpse into what next season's defense could look like with those guys potentially getting even better. So, um, yeah, I think, I mean, I, you know, I think Tennessee prevents presents some challenges that Iowa hasn't, face this season, but I mean, every indication really that we've been given this season is Iowa's defense is going to handle it really well. And it's like, there's not to our knowledge, any like major opt outs or anything defensively. So it's not like I was running out there with some guys that haven't played a whole lot. I I'm curious to kind of see defensively of like, we we've heard a lot about Cohen Entringer and John Nestor, you know, do they, do they get any time out there? Do they, are what are the young guys that, might kind of show flashes in the bowl game because last season it was Xavier Wampa. And obviously that situation was a little bit different because Kayvon Mer Merriweather opted out. But uh, it was also a game where Jazz Patterson kind of broke off a little bit of, of a run that showed what he could do. So curious to see, you know, not only defensively, but who else offensively, maybe who are the young guys that, you know, have a play or two that kind of open your eyes a little bit. Dargan, what do you think about – you've seen this Iowa defense play all year. How do you think it matches up against the Vols? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, when you compare it to the mindset that Iowa had going into that Michigan game, the one, you know, little mental advantage I see is there was a pretty clear understanding in that Michigan game that Iowa had to play perfect in every element, and if they messed up even slightly, Michigan was going to absolutely take advantage of it. And, you know, I, I imagine that's, you know, loosely Iowa's defensive mindset every game with the offense that it has to uh, drag around. But at the same time, I, I feel like that's not exactly the case for this game. You know, the Tennessee offense, for as much as that's the identity of the program under Josh Heupel, it has kind of had some herky jerkiness to the season where, you know, you, you see uh, a stretch where, you know, they they are going getting off the field quickly, three and outs. Um, and so, you know, if Iowa can get Tennessee in that place where, you know, it's kind of in a frustrating, uh, you know, sector of the game, then I think that really bodes well for Iowa being able to to contain it. Um, obviously, the, the biggest thing um, that I would say is Iowa's got to elim eliminate the big plays. Um, they can't let, you know, that's how Tennessee – often hits people is, you know, kind of run, 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 and then a 40-yard bomb over the top. And so, you know, they're, uh, Michigan picked on Deshaun Lee a little bit in that game. Uh, you know, he was the one that got burned in the Nebraska game for the long touchdown. So um, that, that to me is kind of, you know, for as much as this Iowa defense is kind of flawless across the board, you know, there are little spots here and there where you can kind of make your move. And, and then the other thing I would say is, I'm really interested to see how well or not well Tennessee can run the ball because they are down two running backs who are in the portal. Now, Dylan Sampson, who's going to be the lead guy on Monday, 
there's a lot of excitement about him and there's been a lot of talk that he should have been the lead guy for the whole season. So it's not, and, and also there's a, a true freshman who will be the, the number two guy. So it's not like the cupboards completely bare, but um, as you mentioned, Chad, it, it sounds a little backwards, but if Tennessee, you know, Tennessee looks uh, with this year's team to run the ball and, and get that going because that opens up so much more, um, especially with a, a freshman quarterback making his first career start. So it's always key for Iowa to stop the run, but I feel like this game um, is even more impactful and even more important to do that. Yeah, Tyler, you brought up a good point about John Nestor and Cohen Entringer. I mean, uh, could those guys see action? Has John Nestor done enough to maybe you know, take some snaps from Deshaun Lee? We'll see. Um, true freshman that's really gotten a lot of love here in December bowl prep, uh, something to watch. But it looks like based on the glimpses that uh, we saw in practice, all the same guys out there on defense and, um, you know, really healthy team right now for the Hawkeyes. So, all right, number four is a, a kind of an interesting one. Is this Deacon Hill's final start as a Hawkeye quarterback? This I asked him about this yesterday. I was like, yeah, with, uh, you know, with Cade McNamara coming back next year, like, uh, what are your thoughts about this? You know, you may never start. I, I guess I probably shouldn't have <laughs> phrased it that way. But, like, you may never start another game again. I don't think I said it quite that harshly. But it's like kind of the writing's on the wall that this is sort of his last real, you know, clear start as the number one guy for Iowa unless something crazy happens and he beats out Cade McNamara. But uh, what are you guys' thoughts? Tyler, start with you, you know, and is he even the backup next year? I guess we'll uh, we'll see. But uh, is this his final start as a Hawkeye? Well, with, with Cade McNamara's health, you know, I feel like that is kind of a big question. And I feel like he – there's a chance he might be out there on the field more than I would say people would hope. But I don't I mean I, – I don't know if I'm crazy saying this, but I feel like Deacon Hill would be a really good backup. Like I, I feel like he is a guy that if there were the starter to go down in a game, you can trust him, especially next season as a guy that has a ton of experience in a difficult situation um, who can run an offense, you know, come in as, as someone out of the bullpen uh, and, and steady, steady the offense. So I don't think you want to, have him as your number one guy moving forward by any means. But I feel like he is a guy that there is value um, for him to be a backup moving forward, or at least a third string or someone you can count on if, you know, if things go kind of off the wall to, to put in and kind of settle things down. Yeah. He's a well-liked guy for sure on this team. So uh, yeah, I think there's, there definitely is a place for those kinds of guys, but obviously a new offensive coordinator coming in, Dargan is, you know, probably going to want, Cade and then probably someone else behind Cade before Deacon Hill would be my guess. Your thoughts? Yeah, I would probably agree with that. And and I I'll say that this will probably be his last career start. But by the same token, Deacon Hill's already started way more games than I think anybody ever thought he would at Iowa. So um I think, you know, I don't think it's fair to call McNamara injury prone at this point, but he has dealt with three, you know, the the knees and then the quad you know, he has dealt with some significant injuries. And I think it's a fair uh, assessment to say that Iowa needs a competent backup plan um, next season. Now, again, whether that's Deacon Hill, Linus, somebody else, um, you know, that'll all play out down the road. But um, I, I would not be surprised if more than one quarterback starts a game next year for Iowa. I'll say that. Sure. Yeah, my point and yeah, my point of the question was really just, you know, can Deacon Hill make himself into something, uh, something more than he is now? I you know Kirk Ferentz talked about, you know, getting him to kind of cut some weight this off season. You know that, you know, could he be, you know, trimmed down to let's say two thirty or something like that, and uh, you know, be a little bit more mobile and, and really use this year as a launching pad. He's still very, very young. So uh, I, I, I agree that I think this will be his last start. I, I have confidence that, uh, you know, Cade McNamara will be ready for the season. And I think, you know, I think Marco Line is, is an ascending guy. And uh, I think that'll be a fun, I guess, for us to watch 
this spring, Deacon Hill and Mark and Mark Alain. I mean, maybe not that much fun, but Mark Alain is <laughs> out there uh, on the practice field. Uh, you got yeah. to alter your definition of fun. Mm -hmm. when you yeah. Know. What is that you keep hitting? I know you're in your mom's closet, but I'm, I'm just uh, you keep just hitting losing? something. No, it's the other side. You keep hitting something when you make points. Oh, I don't it's know. It's like okay. it might be a coat or something. Okay. <laughs> I think it's a coat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I I guess I should. I yeah. But maybe That's I didn't want to know. Maybe I didn't want to know. Away there. So yeah. Good. Uh, all right. Number five, guys. Uh, uh, just kind of. I like to have a little fun with these last ones. A little open ended. What two to three players have to come up big for Iowa to have a chance? Maybe guys you don't expect. Uh, let's start with you, Dargan. Yeah, I'll, I'll circle back to what I said earlier. I'll say Deshaun Lee because, um, you know, I, I would imagine that Tennessee's, you know, when they dove into Iowa's film, particularly film after Cooper DeGene got hurt, um, there were, you know, some moments when Deshaun Lee looked like the guy who was in there for Cooper DeGene and not the guy who, you know, is is kind of the next man in and expected, you know, little drop-off. So um, I think if he has a, a game where Tennessee's receivers don't get loose for anything big. You know, I know obviously all the passes aren't going to go to him or his side, but um, it was very clear in that Michigan game that they made a point to go after Deshaun Lee. And it wasn't just deep shots. It was stuff over the middle, you know, slants and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think he has a chance certainly to rebound, but, um, you know, I think his play will be uh, pretty important. All right, Tyler. T Dargan only went with one, so you get oh, oh. four yours. I like to, like, name nine when I get these open-up questions. And then, and then you'll brag so. about how you're right yeah. after. It's like you name exactly. half the roster. Um, <laughs> it's true. It's true. I cannot deny it. Um, um, I'll, I'll go say, for it, Tyler. I'll, I'll, say, the floor. I'll say Xavier Wampa. Um, you know, he, he got the cast off now that – ever since he got hurt against Wisconsin. And, um, you know, I think if, if there's some throws that sail, you know, that he he's has both hands available now to uh, intercept him. So I think he, you know, this, this could be, you know, he did last season um, against Kentucky in the bowl game, had the pick six. So uh, it could be a chance for him to kind of solidify, you know, what, what has been a solid first full season starting for him. You know, he hasn't done anything, uh, you know, ridiculous, but he's been a solid, solid guy on Iowa's defense. And then I'll say Caleb Johnson um, hasn't been exactly the season that I think people expected from him in terms of a, of a, of a, of a breakout guy, but um, think that he can break some, he's, he's hit some home runs this season in terms of in getting some long runs. So, um, you know, physical back obviously, but I think, uh, you know, him and LeSean Williams, uh, you know, maybe Caleb would be the, the second tier guy that you would expect to have a big game out of those two. But I, you know, I think he could, he could build some confidence with this game as well. Yeah. I guess this is a good point to, or a spot to say, you know, Kirk Ferentz yesterday saying probably won't have an offensive coordinator in place until maybe the third week in January. So, um, you know, how does that affect a guy like, you know, we, we're not planting any rumors or anything like that, but, it's just that running backs room is so crowded. You know, a guy like Caleb Johnson or Jazzy and Patterson, just their performance in this game, you know, certainly something to watch. You know, how much are they used? How much are they not used? You know, could that affect uh, what decision they make? Because they have until January 2nd to enter the transfer portal. Um, again, not suggesting that any of them are even thinking about it, but you, you just look at the numbers and and kind of how Caleb has been used lately, and you just still have to wonder, even though he said he's a hog for life. Okay, so I got to name some. You guys left me a lot of names, so uh, I'm gonna say <laughs> I'm gonna go with. I'll start on defense. Uh, uh, Y.A. Black is that a is that a a guy? I mean, I think you need kind of five star type of guys uh, to step up in this game. He's been banged up. I think he was on the verge of having a really really great year. Uh, I think he's played through some stuff, but we've seen him out there in practice now. And, you know, he could be a guy maybe, you know, uh, Jamari talked about, you know, the defensive line having to win those battles. I think maybe this is the the type of guy you want to have out there, 6'5", 300 plus pounds to kind of own the line of scrimmage and, and kind of affect things. Okay, so that's one. I got eight more to go. Uh, let's go with um, – no, uh, I'll stick on that side of the ball just as a little bit of a wild card. Just say Brian Allen. We saw him in the uh, the uh, Big Ten title game. He only played a handful of snaps, but I, you know he's been out there this week, 
And a guy that uh, really is rising, could he maybe be, again, an athletic guy that can compete against this SEC type of talent? And, uh, and I didn't mean that uh, negatively, Dargan's SEC type. They are SEC talent. Um, but, uh, you know, Brian Allen, uh, I got to price some more, but I'll just stop. Uh, t- since you only said one, Dargan, I'll give you one more. Oh, man. Um, I'm a, Maybe this is a – this is a cop out, but I'm going to go Deacon Hill because um, his, you know, even though he's the quarterback, he is kind of an X factor because you don't really know exactly how much production or how much stability you're going to get. Um, and I don't know. I don't know why, but I just have this weird feeling that because there's so much confidence from Tennessee's side that Iowa's offense is bad, that there's going to be at least one play where you're kind of like, did, did, the, did Deacon just do that? And so um, I don't know. Again, I don't want to, I don't want to give away my prediction here, but um, I think there's going to be at least one or two throws that Deacon Hill makes that maybe don't fit with, with a lot of the other production that he's put on the field this year. So I'll go with Deacon. All right. My third guy is K- I, we said two to three, so I'm going to, I'm going to stick under three, but Caleb Brown, uh, I just think uh, he's he. I'm sticking with like the athletes here. Uh, I think he's ascending, and I imagine he's a big part of the game plan, especially with Tennessee's secondary attrition. You got anyone else, Tyler? I'll, I'll throw in Deontay Craig. He's he's had quietly a really good season on the defensive line. Been an impactful guy, you know, especially rushing the passer. Think he could be key. And um, sorry, a car's going off around me here. Uh, I think he could be key in. Um, in in being able to just keep the pocket centered. Wow, that's craziness over there. That, I thought that was I, a like alarm. there's someone like drilling a hole above <laughs> me. I'm just yeah. Oh, man. I don't know you go in your closet. All right, we got <laughs> we could we could keep this under an hour. So we got three minutes left to, to do that. Let's go to predictions, Dargan. You already said you made yours, so that gives me more time to think about mine. Go ahead. I'm gonna say 17, 13 balls. Right. Re- so that surprised some people, huh? That that heard you say that. Yeah, well, you know, I I think again, I, I think that this game is going to look like an Iowa game, and, and I think Tennessee's offense is going to be able to break through just a little bit more than some of those teams down the stretch of the season that Iowa faced. Um, so yeah, I I mean, I guess that that does allow the under to hit because I think it's at like thirty six somewhere in there. So that that number <laughs> that number has been pretty baffling for Tennessee fans to digest. Um, that you know that's that's where Vegas thinks things are going to land. But um, I think Iowa does cover. But I'm going to go 17, 13 balls. Uh, noon Central Time on ABC. I can't remember if I said that. I usually like to say that just for those of you uh, tuning in. Tyler, what do you got? 17, 10 Iowa. Uh, I think it'll be similar to a lot of the Iowa games we've seen this season. I think the defense will maybe at first be a little bit having to adjust to to the freshman QB, and I'll just leave it at that before my ceiling collapses on me. (laughs) Dargan, 10 points for the Vols. Do you see a a scenario, uh, according to Tyler, do you see a scenario in which that occurs? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if Tennessee can't run the ball and Nico looks like you know, even for all his hype, looks like a dude who's not been out there. I mean, that's that's right where Iowa wants Iowa's defense can kind of settle in and really get the game at their pace and their tempo. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's I I know I guess I'm being branded as the Tennessee Homer on this podcast, but I I really really wanted to pick Iowa. I, I came very close to picking Iowa. I've been I guess defending Iowa to my uh, various friends and family who are asking me about the game. Um, I do feel like I need to get this one right, though, if I know uh, <laughs> how much how much I pay attention to both of these teams. But yeah, um, right. Yeah, right. I mean, I th- I think there's definitely a, a scenario where Tennessee's offense sputters and and can't really get a whole lot going after maybe the first drive or so. So yeah, that's that's not absurd by any means. I think Iowa scores on defense in this one. First, be the first defensive touchdown since Sebastian Castro, right? I'm not missing anything. Um, 17-16 Iowa. And I, it could be a blocked extra point by YA Black. 
that win that wins it for the Hawkeyes. But we're not going to see an interior Thompson block because he's not with the team anymore. That's why yeah. I, Brian Allen. You mentioned him, but mm-hmm. he could be a factor next season because of mm-hmm. yeah the the kind of hole that Ontario leaves. And I think that came as a little bit of a surprise because it seemed like Ontario was kind of in line for a big role next season. But um, Brian I mean, Brian Allen, because going back to the kids they had, Kenick, he looked really good. Uh, you know, he, he was one of the standouts from then. So it uh, feels like he he's a guy that has a lot of potential that could be a factor on the defensive line moving forward. Yeah, and Deontay Craig, to mention um, what you mentioned earlier, spoke really glowingly about Brian Allen, just how he's a sponge. That was the word he used. So it's not like he's just an athletic talent. He's a guy that's learning a lot too. Thanks to both of you for uh, your contributions and all year. It's been a really fun season to cover the team with you guys and uh, I feel like we've done a pretty good job, and there's still more to come at Hawk Central. Uh, got my game preview still to come. I guess I spoiled my prediction already, but I'll, I'll kind of you know go into some details about the game. And I think it's gonna be if Iowa doesn't score on defense, I don't know if they win. So uh, I'm I guess I'm calling that uh, shot there. But uh, let's see what's next. Uh, the team goes to this fun spot theme park tomorrow. We'll have a few more interviews tomorrow. Maybe, 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 maybe get to talk to Luke Lachey there. But um, we will uh, uh, kind of – and then we get Kirk Ferentz and Josh Heupel on Sunday, if I can get these these days correct. So that's what's on the menu coming up. And uh, you've got hoops. Dargan, uh, you staying in Tennessee for a while or what? Yeah, I'll be back. Uh, well, I'll, I'll actually be back in Iowa by the time the game starts. So that's, uh, that's my first day back from this little PTO stretch. And then uh, the women have Michigan State at home, I believe, next week. I think that's the next game after Minnesota. So jumping right back into the, the Caitlin Clark show, which is never ends. But that's a good thing. <laughs> well, it, yeah, I mean, it could end this season. So she may only have 17 regular season games well, left. Yeah, whatever, so. uh, Tyler, uh, got any uh, Iowa men's hoops thoughts before we go? A lot left to prove, you know, yeah. going into Big Ten play after tonight. There's opportunities, but – uh, if they want a chance at making the NCAA tournament, they gotta they gotta get things done with some urgency. Great stuff, guys. Dar- for Dark and Southern and Tyler Tashman, this is Chad Lysico of the Des Moines Register. We all work for the Register. We thank you very much for tuning into this extra long podcast, and we appreciate your uh, following our coverage. Take care. <laughs>